Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us today for our virtual Meet the Experts session. My name's Morna and I'm part of the My World of Work Live team with Skills Development Scotland. My World of Work Live is all about helping you to understand future careers and what skills they might need. Now this week we're celebrating Careers Week, providing even more opportunities to consider what career you might want to pursue. You might see some adverts on social media, so keep your eyes peeled. Today we'll be talking about careers uh, in our session and we're going to be covering an overview of the life and chemical sciences sector. We'll have a look at some of the opportunities within that sector and today we'll be speaking to our expert Dr Ian Simpson from the University of Edinburgh School of Informatics and you'll also have the opportunity to ask Ian any questions about his career journey and the sector itself. So I'd like to encourage you to get involved as much as possible throughout the session today. Please use the question and answer box to the right of your screen to ask us any questions and we'll try and answer as many as we possibly can. Also I'd like to let you know that today's session is being recorded and that's so that young people who couldn't make it on to the session today can still access the resources and it will be available for everyone to watch on the My World of Work YouTube channel. So that means you can go back and rewatch everything that we've been speaking about today. Please don't worry, anything that you ask can be anonymous. If you prefer, you just select that option on the Q&A box. So before I introduce you to our expert for today, let's have a wee look at some of the information for life and chemical sciences here in Scotland. We call this labour market information. So the industry currently has around 18,400 people working in the life sciences sector. And as of 2020, there were around 11,600 people working in the chemical sciences sector, and that's across a wide variety of roles. So it could be engineers, production technicians, manufacturing, it could be in the finance sector, um, legal departments, all, all manner of things, lots of varied roles. There are around 240 chemical science companies throughout Scotland. And for the year 2020, the average salary for jobs in that in those sectors was £30,000. The life and chemical sciences sectors add an estimated £4.798 million to the Scottish economy um, last year, which was an increase of 22% from 10 years before that. So it's a really important developing sector and something that's continuing to develop and will have many more job opportunities to come. So on that note, saying that for the future, there will be nearly 30,000 new job opportunities in those industries for the years 2019 to 2029. So again, loads of different roles there. So engineering, science, <coughs> production technicians, you know, lab assistants, these kind of things. And there will be an additional 11% future growth in those industries from uh, up to 5.345 million by 2030. So today we will be speaking to uh, Dr Ian Simpson from the University of Edinburgh School of Informatics. So informatics is the study um, of the structure, behaviour and interactions of natural um, and engineered compute computational systems. <laughs> but I will let Ian take you through a much more in-depth um, sort of covering and, and introduction of his role. So Ian um, is the director um, of the Centre for Doctoral Training. He also um, originally trained in biochemistry and genetics and uh, is a fantastic representative of this field. So I'll pass you over to Ian now and he can take us uh, through that. So morning Ian, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate you being here. Thanks very much Lorna. Um, good morning everyone. Um, very happy to be here and looking forward to answering any questions you might have. It's always nice to see your, your life bullet pointed in four bullet points. Uh, so <laughs> Yeah, so I'm happy to, to answer questions about yeah anything you like related to yeah my work or the industry. That's that's uh, very happy to do that. Um, brief background, as as Mourner said, yeah I I started off much more in experimental sciences, uh, but my interests um, developed quite quickly into looking at how lots and lots of genes uh, are regulated in brain development, and that led me to computers because it soon became apparent that you couldn't possibly understand all these things. If you tried to do it manually, you needed to use computers to help understand and work with all that data. And that led me, I guess, to where I am now, which is I'm, I'm a reader in what's called biological informatics. That really means you're using computers to study biology. Um, and reader means old lecturer. Um, 
So, and I am also director of what's called a Centre for Doctoral Training, and this is where we train PhD students, so the next generation of research, independent researchers. Um, and that's an international thing, so we have applicants from all over the world that come into that centre. And by the end of that centre, we will have trained at least 60 of those uh, who will then go out into the world and hopefully do great things. So, um, just the, I guess a brief, a brief background of, uh, you know, the range of informatics is very large, so it covers everything from uh, actually the nuts and bolts of computers and how they're put together and how they operate all the way out to real applications out in the world with telecommunications systems, the internet, working with hospitals and doctors and clinicians, all these sorts of things. So a really vast range. My specialism is, is looking at medical data and biomolecular data. So things like, as I mentioned, gene expression and things like this and try and work out how we can improve our understanding of human disease and how we can improve patient outcomes uh, from our research. We want to do things that actually have an impact in, in society. Um, I hope that's a, a good enough start. Um, I'm very happy to hand over to back to Mona. That was excellent. No, great introduction there. So I've I've got plenty of questions. So as I say, we'll op we've got it opened up to questions now for our young people out there, which is fantastic. And we do have some coming in. I think maybe also just to start off, see with like the this this subject of informatics and um, computational biology. Is this a relatively new field, or is this something that's been around for a while? It's a good question. The first week of the course I teach on bioinformatics actually covers this. So this is it is for a lot of people it appears to be a new field, but it's actually been around for 40 or 50 years. Uh, and the real limitation has been the data itself. So uh, it, it was very technically difficult to, to actually measure the things we need to measure from biological systems. And it's actually the advances in technology that have really launched the whole discipline into a massive subject, which can now you can take a degree in this subject. Uh, you can do a master's in this subject, a PhD in this subject, you can spend the rest of your life working in this subject. So it is now a very much a big um, inter interdisciplinary degree. So we have people from all kinds of backgrounds, maths, engineering, physics, chemistry, biology, computing science, um, and even from social science and some of the humanities. So it is a very large field because of course it, it has an impact on, on society as well. So we need to think about things like social, ethical, legal aspects of, of the field. Excellent. That's uh, that's fantastic. That's kind of helped me a little bit as well, because when I when you hear about it, you think, I wonder, like, has that been around for a while? Or it must be brand new when you think about sort of computational aspects of it. So excellent. Right. So we've got some good questions coming in. Um, what would you say are like the really enjoyable parts of your job? So um, the most enjoyable parts are uh, generally where I'm doing the actual research. So as you get a bit more senior, you, you tend to do a bit more administrative work and, and management type things. So when I'm meeting with my PhD students or with the students who are doing projects in my group, and also when I'm teaching and I, I interacting with students, that that's really enjoyable. Um, that's why I'm in a university, um, but also seeing where they go next and what they do next, seeing that journey from somebody who's coming in with lots of enthusiasm, but needing to learn extra skills um, as they get those skills and become more confident, they become more independent and then they go off and they get uh, they get jobs all over the world. So it's uh, that's really exciting to see. So I enjoy that. That's what that gives me a lot of pleasure. That sounds really good. Yeah, it's always nice to see people succeeding in something that you've helped them to sort of get involved in. Fantastic. So I suppose on the on the sort of flip side of that, then, like, are there any specific challenges within this sector or your role in particular? So I guess I'm I'm talking about um, there are lots of challenges. Um, that's part of what makes it interesting is that if it was all easy, perhaps I wouldn't be quite so quite so interested in it. But yeah, so there are there are the, the mundane things that are challenging to do with things like workloads. And and uh, obviously over the last two years, we've had to deal with COVID in teaching, which is very difficult. Um, yeah. And also for research has been very difficult. Um, I think, you know, it, there's always a challenge. It's very competitive, you know, certainly the academic side of things, you know, publishing in good journals, getting grants, winning grants, these are all highly competitive things. So stressful, but you know, lots of highs and lows, but yes, it's uh, overall the net plus. So yeah, it's something I ultimately do enjoy doing. Fantastic, I suppose, yes, there's always a bit of a tricky, a, a bad, a, not, I don't want to say bad side, but a, a more difficult, uh, challenging side to it. Excellent. So if we've got any young people out there that are thinking, right, okay, um, sounds quite sounds quite interesting like what what would you say would be good subjects for them to take at school so 
I mean, naturally, this this whole area is 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 technical, but I do like to highlight that research doesn't research and teaching in this area doesn't go on in a vacuum. Um, it, my job wouldn't be possible without a huge team of people that come from almost every possible aspect of of life, working life. So that includes finance, legal, um, human resources, um, various administrators and managers, uh, and so. If I were to draw a little diagram of all the people involved in what we do, it would be huge. There would be hundreds of people that actually make my job possible. Um, now, if you're interested in the in the more technical aspects of things, then of course you know you're going to want to focus on some science and maths related courses. Um, that doesn't mean you have to do all of the sciences, and it doesn't mean you have to do everything to the highest possible level. It will depend on your interest. It will depend on your aptitude and the things you want to do. So, as I've mentioned, you know, even at this the, the, the sort of the highest level of degree, which is the PhD program I talked about, we have people coming from really very, very different backgrounds. So, ultimately, because computer science is quite a, a technical subject, then we do have people with reasonable math skills, but not everybody has the highest possible math skills, you might imagine. And we train people, we develop people from where they are to where they want to get to. So it's not a closed shop to people who only take three sciences and maths. It is, in fact, much broader than that. Fantastic. That's that's excellent. We've got a really good question that's coming from our audience there. Like what what would you say are the key skills then required for for your kind of job or even being part of the informatics um, department? Yeah, so I think it changes as you go through. I think um, like with most jobs, you need to you need to be good at organising your time. You need to be able to prioritise what are the things you absolutely have to do now and the things that could wait a bit longer. You need to be very resilient. I mentioned this success and failure cycle of papers and grants and things like this. So, you know, you need to be able to pick yourself up and and keep going. Uh, that's true in a lot of jobs, but it's perhaps there are perhaps aren't so many jobs where you are maybe not judged, but certainly your your output is directly measurable. <laughs> so, you yeah. know, it's there is that element to it. So I think resilience is important. Um, also being open to ideas, always learning. Um, so I, I, I'm still learning stuff all the time um, and, you know, it's that's important having that. And that's one of the reasons it's quite an interesting thing to do, because you get new challenges every day and you need to, to learn things as the world moves, because the world doesn't wait for us. We just have to try and keep up with with progress as, as it goes on. Absolutely. I think that's something that was really quite apt over the past couple of years is that things are constantly going and, and everybody has adapted, I would say, really quite well to all the different sort of the new normal as, it, as it's called. So uh, good, good question there. Thanks. That's a really great answer. Another very interesting question from the attendees. Um, what are some of the things or tasks that you can now do with the use of computers and like your AI software kind of idea? Well, the question is more what we can't do. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> no, I mean, this is the, the problem is, of course, the promise is huge, but the delivery is the thing that's crucial with all, all research. So um, AI is um, the name has been kind of captured and perhaps applied in places where it shouldn't be applied. Um, but using machine intelligence and machine learning um, on, on large and complex data sets has enabled us to learn more about the world we live in than we ever could before, things that are simply not possible to do any other way. Um, that's required um, new discoveries in the methods, the maths methods, but also new developments in computing. So every year, faster chips, more powerful processors become available. And that that has what has really happened in my subject is that that has coincided with an avalanche of data from the biomedical sciences. So luckily those two things coincided and it has really sort of seeded a whole new era of us learning from data. And so you'd be hard pressed now not to see a week in the news where some big discovery that has required machine learning in, in the biomedical domain. So an example would be um, there's a company called Excientia, which um, developed one of the world's first AI design drugs. So we're now able to there's been some revolutions in how we predict the structure of particular proteins and things like this and it's allowed us to improve how we can test out before we even make anything which uh, structures are likely to be useful as drugs and which aren't and that saves a huge amount of money and time and it's allowed us to develop whole, whole new kinds of drugs gosh that sounds quite incredible so actually just picking up on something that you're saying there more just for clarity for myself maybe for anybody outside that's listening when you're saying machine learning like what what do you mean by that like if you can give yeah, us a definition that's on that a good question so so this an example of machine learning would be um if we 
we have a we have some data, so maybe it might be something like flicking flicking a coin, um, and we might do that thousands and thousands of times. Of course, our expectation is that that half the time it's going to be heads and half the time it's going to be tails. But actually, the data might not support that. There could be something different about that coin. And what a machine will what what you can do is train a machine using a mathematical model to actually learn from the data um, and then predict what's going to happen next. So say for example that that was a biased coin. Uh, and in fact, it was head 60% of the time. If the model learns that from the data, it would then predict a greater likelihood of that occurring than you would expect from from chance or your prior your personal prior expectations. So it's about machines trying to see learn patterns from data that you provide and then use that data to predict something in the future. And that's probably a reasonable explanation of, of machine learning. Yeah, definitely. So it's very, I would, I'm also maybe just forgive me if I'm wrong here, like it's very dependent on the data and how it's interpreted, whether Absolutely. that be by the machine or by the people in your sort of side as well. Is that correct? Yeah, so, so you know, the, the, there's a huge debate going on about bias. So we might think our training data is unbiased, but in fact, there's, there's no such thing as un unbiased training data. An example might be something close to what we look at, which is we can study how the genetics of populations changes and we can make predictions about, uh, like, for example, disease susceptibility. So whether someone is likely to be uh, slightly at higher risk of a particular disease. But just it turns out that a lot of the, the sequence data that we need to do those studies has been garnered from Western populations. So it's not necessarily very reflective of uh, you know, Africa, for example, or Asia. And so on, on the top level, you might think, well, we've got hundreds of thousands of people's um, DNA sequences here, and this is going to be really useful. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, in fact, that data is biased and we need to acknowledge that. So, yeah, there is there is definitely an, an element of being very careful about what you put in to these these training models. Yeah. Right. Excellent. Great. The questions keep popping up. So fantastic. Another question from our audience here. Um, is there something that you've researched or been involved in that's been sort of that we would maybe know about that's been that we would recognize as having been part of our lives or impacted in our lives some way or you know is there has benefited society well <laughs> uh yeah i guess i guess so in so much as you know uh, perhaps because what we do is very technical it wouldn't it, what we're not doing at the moment so much is is something that would perhaps impact you know the, the audience in their daily lives obviously but we're we operate kind of in that middle layer where we're taking a lot of the data and building models that are then used by other people. So what would be an example of, of something would be uh, where, for example, maybe you've built something that might uh, predict where a, a particular problem occurs in an organ in, a, in, a, in an MRI scan. So, for example, a machine that's scanned patients and maybe somebody in my field would develop a model that would identify where that is. Those, you probably wouldn't actually know about that development, but as a patient, you would experience it because the doctor on their machine has this algorithm that's actually helping them to identify which parts of a scan are things they need to look at and things they need to assess. So often a lot of the technical stuff is is not in the headlines. You, the headlines are the drug that's been developed or this new piece of, of equipment that, that some doctors used in a study. So there are probably some examples of more famous things, perhaps some of the big studies to do with um, something called UK Biobank, where some of that that's hit the news often over the last few years, where across the UK, we've taken very large numbers of people and gathered lots of medical data and sequence data about them. And that resource has been made available under suitable licensing, etc. Um, to the to the research population and various studies have looked at links between lifestyle and, and things like this and cognition and aging and things. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of it is just slightly under the radar. And, and that's important, actually, that, that we try to shine a light on it more. Yeah, no, excellent. I think that's it. I think obviously having this session is, is, a, is a really good sort of first step for a lot of young people as well, especially and also me as well. <laughs> this is, is really interesting. And another question from the audience here. Um, how much training would you need in order to use any of the software involved in the sort of research and things that you're doing? It's a really interesting question. So <clears throat> on the face of it, you'd think, oh, well, I have to get to some really high level. But there's a brilliant study that was done uh, by a clinician in the UK, actually, which developed uh, a bunch of tools that other doctors could use to train models like the ones I've been talking about. And it was made available to clinicians who used it because of how that method was presented to them. They were able to use that without any specialist training 
in in the subjects that I work in. And that kind of democratization of, of the methods is a really important thing. So there are increasingly tools which make the power of machine learning available to people who may not necessarily be experts in in using it. And that that has pros and cons because they might not necessarily understand how it works. But it, it's been shown in certainly in the case I, I mentioned that that actually get led to real outcomes for, for patients in hospitals in the UK. So that that's very promising. Fantastic. OK, great. Another one, uh, this is actually a really interesting one. So um, our audience are wondering, would you be able to sort of talk them through an average day um, in your role and, you know, the sort of how it relates to like the AI side of it and things and what you what you do with it? <laughs> OK, so there's there's a number of strands to that, I guess. So um, <laughs> it depends what time of year it is. So at the moment I'm embroiled in, in my, one of my main teaching times. So that tends to dominate a lot of my work and uh, I teach largely at master's level at the moment, so there is some machine learning in, in the course that I teach. Um, I also, as, as you know, run this, this doctoral training centre, so we're organising events, talks from internationally famous people in AI and machine learning and, and biomedicine. And um, also we, we, we organise projects for our students to take uh, where they have supervisors from across the university with different skills in different areas. Um, so that's really interesting. They propose you know, new research ideas that the students then take on. So that's that part of things. On the on the other side, um, I'm a fellow of the Alan Turing Institute as of the 1st of October this year, and that is the UK's National AI Centre. So this is a place that is, is designed to help develop the field of artificial intelligence slash machine learning in all kinds of different application areas and I'm, I'm interested in particularly in the health data science area and so there's all kinds of work we do there to do with um, developing new ideas new topics new fields of study we have these working groups that might focus on a particular problem and that brings together scientists from all over the uk and sometimes international experts as well so that's that side the research side um, we largely work on what what we call graphs or networks so not the graph like the XY graph you, you might see in school, but here imagine like a spider web where the, the little points on the spider web are pieces of information and then the, the strands on the web are the, the evidence that we have connecting those together. So you can you can actually model a lot of the data that I've been talking about in large, very, very large graphs like that. And we can perform um, learning on those graphs so we can try and identify patterns in those graphs that can help us to learn more about what we're modelling. One of our big projects is on autism at the moment, so we have about 150,000 autism patients in a network like that with lots of associated wow. clinical and genetic data, and we're trying to learn what uh, what we can about how the um, how the disease is is sort of wired underneath in terms of the genes and the proteins involved. So that that's what my group are doing in terms of our sort of AI research. It's called graph learning. Wow, gosh, it sounds very involved. So <laughs> it's good, good, um, good uh, information to kind of get. It's quite a varied role that you have. So obviously, with what you've been speaking about, the young people are thinking, "Gosh, this sounds, you know, quite technical and things like that." What they're asking, how much in terms of your role is related to maths specifically, and like, do you have to be good at maths, really good at maths, and like, you know, what what types of maths do you use in your role? OK, so um, I think there's room, there's quite a broad room. Uh, so there are people for people who are developing completely new techniques in machine learning. They would commonly have a very strong maths background, not always, but nearly always. Um, for people who are applying machine learning methods or maybe adapting existing ones to particular circumstances, more commonly, they, they need not necessarily be particularly strong in maths. It's not going to hurt to be strong in maths, but but it's much easier to get into that part of the machine learning atmosphere if you're if you're if you're in that category. Um, so the sorts of maths that we tend to use in the field, you probably won't begin to experience until higher maths and probably advanced higher maths. So much of what you might want to know, you wouldn't actually begin learning probably even until you you go to university. So if you're worried, oh, I don't know any about anything about that right now, that's not surprising. You wouldn't really be taught anything. Mm -hmm. Um, regression is one of the, the basic starting blocks of machine learning and I suspect you don't learn that in higher maths. So 
uh, maybe you begin to fit lines. Uh, I think you do begin to fit lines in higher maths, but that's about it. It's, so the, the main field is based around uh, things like linear algebra, which are classic degree subjects. So people shouldn't worry if they don't know about it now. Um, and often when you come into degree courses in your first year, there will be foundational courses, um, you know, which take you from scratch up to up to speed, especially in, in subjects like physics and maths. They will teach you from scratch effectively. OK, OK, well, that's good to know. So I suppose a, a question that's kind of coming into my mind then, Ian, is do you have to go to university in order to work in this sector? Well, like obviously you run the doctoral program there, but you know, if, if we've got any young people out there that are thinking I wouldn't actually mind working in like biomedical AI, machine learning, that kind of thing, but I don't know if I want to go down the university route. So yeah. what sort of so, advice so would you give them? Are. So there's never been a better time to, to explore other options too. So um, increasingly um, higher education and further education providers are running data science related courses um, online and in person, um, even inside the uh, the SQA curriculum. Now there's there's this National Progression Award in data science, which is being developed further and further. And you can take that, I think, up to up to higher level at the moment. Uh, so there are lots of opportunities there. And also increasingly employers are retraining and developing their workforce in data science skills using the kinds of courses that are being run, not just in the UK actually, but all over the world. And because you can deliver these online nowadays, um, there are a lot of incredibly high quality courses available and lots of employers actually pay pay to, uh, to train their employees. So absolutely, and also sh I should say that a lot of companies will take people in and, and want to develop them down a specific route um, so sometimes, you know, you, you might come out of a university with a particular set of courses you've done and a particular set of skills, and they might not always marry up perfectly with what a particular company or an industry might want. So it's not uncommon for industries to take people in in, in training training roles where they, they, they develop them through the company, often taking advantage of courses offered by universities elsewhere, and you develop along a path that really fits with what the company needs. So there are definitely non-academic routes. Obviously, it re requires skills training, but it doesn't mean a degree. It doesn't have to mean a degree. That's good to know. So it's not something that's just like, you know, you're sort of barred at the door, you know, excellent. Yeah. So and actually it's sort of on that route as well, even, um, you know, we have apprenticeships available um, here in Scotland, which is which are fantastic opportunities. So I think like a really good one might be related to what you're talking about maybe would be something like data analytics um you know because it's it's vital to a lot of sectors and data analysts can work in almost any any industry so if any young people out there are thinking oh i'm quite good with numbers i quite like problem solving that's that's a really good apprenticeship to go down and we can cover that a little bit more later so is there any way that maybe the young people out there could get involved now as a as a as a pupil at school like are there any sort of work experience opportunities you know how, how would they be able to get involved at yes, this stage? So, so most universities will offer um, activities to schools I know the University of Edinburgh certainly does we in the School of Informatics here we've we've invested in a quite a few posts now of people working with computer education in schools um, who develop outreach activities and also run events in the school itself the best thing to do is to contact contact us or contact you know a local university and they would definitely be able to help specifically here um, we have this data education in schools program that, that I think Mona has a link for it that we can share with you um, and they have developed specific modules for example as part of this national progression award but they also run activities they have some really cool there's one about uh, I think locating rhinos uh, using ge geospatial data and things like this and that's been developed for schools so there are quite a lot of these things out and about there um, so well worth having a look around and yeah I mean researchers in the university definitely do um, take in you know have school children in, in summer projects and things like this to get them some experience so that's definitely something that could be done. Fantastic that's a great opportunity and what I'll do is when I follow up with all the teachers that have got their schools booked in I'll share all the links and everything as well that Ian had sent through. I had a wee look myself and they were very interesting so excellent. Um, very good question and we've got some more from the attendees. Um, do you work with robots is a good question. <laughs> Curses. <laughs> and if anyone comes to visit, they just want to see the robots. Yeah, yes. so we've got we've got a load of we've got a load of very good robots here. We we 
I personally don't work with robots. If I could think of an excuse as to why I could work with a robot, I would. But no, <laughs> so there are people who work in my in the CDT, uh, some of the researchers there that work with prosthetic arms, so robotic arms. So um, what's quite an interesting development in that field is that um, you can use muscle, remaining muscle signals in what remains of the arm uh, to help uh, guide the robotic arm. And that mechanism by which the, the muscle can communicate can can in fact be trained using machine learning. So there's a really, really great research group here that are working with patients who have prosthetic limbs to develop new um, software to control the arms. And they, they're much more precise, they're much more realistic. And yeah, there's a lot of that kind of research going on. You may be aware that Edinburgh is part of the National Robotarium. So we, we do have some spectacular robots in the building, but unfortunately I don't get to play with them. Oh. Well, do you know what? Actually, even you just saying like that's fantastic to to know that we're at that stage where you can put a prosthetic onto an individual that maybe needs it and it's still able to pick up the sort of signals. And the, so it's that crossover, to, I suppose, between physiology and then the machine learning as well. That's amazing. Actually, this kind of sort of links into what we've just been speaking about. Do you think there will ever be a stage um, with AI machine learning where the computers will make all the decisions and it kind of takes out the need for human inter human in intervention this is quite a good question from our singularity here. <laughs> yeah. um, quite a good question from our attendees there and how do you think that would affect your role when when it comes down to some machine learning at the moment is is like i mean this might be controversial with my colleagues but it's 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 largely it's largely about um you know the maths and statistics at the moment we there are some really exciting things happening in in the world of cognition understanding how how you make decisions but true ai is is a long way away at the moment so i don't you know as somebody who spent a long long time studying the brain it's a it's an incredibly complex uh, organism we don't understand organ we don't we don't understand a lot about what the brain does and how it works you know it's a, it's a phenomenally efficient computer it's more powerful than the most powerful computer in the world and runs on the power of less than one light bulb so it is it is a really incredible thing and our understanding of how we can reason uh, using computers is still in its infancy there are some interesting developments in that field but it's, i don't believe personally that it's something that we're going to be solving for some time yet and maybe not ever wow okay so where where do you think like the future of ai might take I, I, far take prefer, the I prefer the kind of collaborative approach where we use um, AI machine learning to help guide guide decisions by humans. And right. certainly in my field, that's how you want it to be. I don't think many people would be particularly happy if, if a critical life or death decision was made by an algorithm, um, mm -hmm. especially if, if it wasn't clear how the algorithm was making that decision. So we, we like to talk in terms of assisting assistive technology, I think, certainly for now and, and probably for a long time yet. Um, I don't think society is ready and I don't think the technology is ready to do that kind of uh, a crucial decision making process. Right, that's a really good question. And actually just something you were saying there about algorithms, a uh, question from our audience. Is AI pretty much the same thing as an algorithm or, you know, is there a difference or can you explain that a little bit more? Um, so unfortunately, the word, as is often the case, the word AI has been kind of hijacked. So, so artificial intelligence means something quite different. So artificial intelligence is kind of what you've been talking about. So mm -hmm. um, the ability to make decisions, to, to, to think in inverted commas, and we don't have true AI. Um, but machine learning is much more about, yeah, machine learning, how you would, how you would actually realise machine learning is by implementing algorithms that do different things. So they might optimise some procedure or there might be some function that you want to calculate. The algorithms that do that are integrated together to make something that would, would be a machine learning approach to, to a problem. So algorithms are kind of the nuts and bolts that you use to actually achieve the machine learning sort of process. Right. OK, excellent. So you're a STEM ambassador, which is obviously a really interesting thing. Why do you think it's so important to, you know, be interested and in trying to engage more people in STEM? Um, because our lives depend on it, because our, <laughs> our planet depends upon it. Um, there's only one way out of the current mess that we're in in the climate, and that's science. Um, ultimately, ultimately, that science has to be implemented by politicians in various uh, countries, etc. But Actually, the solutions, the problem, ultimately, the problem is caused by, you know, um, you know, combustion engine and things that were invented by science.
but science has many solutions. Uh, solar panels, you know, renewable energy, all these sorts of things are part of that. But there's carbon capture, there's all kinds of technologies, planting seagrass on the, on the seabed, you know, to sequester carbon. All of these are science based solutions, things that need to be designed, planned, tested, quantified. And so uh, and every every aspect of your life is surrounded by computing. You know, the watch you have on your arm, the phone you have in your pocket, the computers, the TVs, every almost every device you have at home is is some scientific device. And increasingly, they 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 are doing machine learning. They're they're looking at what you're doing. Tesco are looking at what you're buying. Amazon look at what you're buying. In a world where tech technology is so dominant, I think it's important that everybody engages with it and begins to think about the implications of what that means, the opportunities that it presents, but also the challenges that it presents to us as a society. So the more engaged and interested people are in that, the better, as far as I can see. Fantastic, you know, very, very encouraging, very um, inspiring answer there. We are coming towards the end, so I suppose maybe the last question to do is obviously with the topic we've been thinking about machine learning and its use in like biomedical, like where, what do you think maybe might be the next step for like machine learning in its use in the sort of this health sector side that you're maybe more interested, more involved in there? Well, I think there's um, a lot of I mean, it gets a bit boring at this point, I guess. <laughs> so, <laughs> a lot of the simple things just aren't really ready for it. So, you know, this this like many scientific discoveries, it's kind of taken almost taken the world by surprise in some ways, just how quickly things have accelerated. And so our ethics frameworks, our legal processes, it's just like with social media, they haven't really caught up with the technology. So we need to have um, we need to be very careful, especially with medical data that we bring the public along with us and that we real that they realize that, you know, this is a, a trusted responsibility. Um, and so I think a lot of work needs to be done to make sure that the right checks and balances are in place to protect people's private information when people are doing these kinds of studies in terms of actual usage. What we want to see is these methods being adopted in GP practices in hospitals around the world. And it's happening, but you know things like the NHS are vast systems with old computers. Actually, bringing machine learning into those environments is not an easy thing to do. And there are some companies and some higher education institutions that are working really hard to put in place pilot schemes. There are three really excellent schemes in in Scotland, um, particularly to do with medical imaging, where they have huge supercomputers installed in hospitals that are are actually delivering machine learning solutions in in a clinical setting, but. That's just the tip of the iceberg. We need a complete transformation of how this works for us to realise the potential of, of AI in this field. And that's what's yes. coming next. And that's what's coming next. Yes, so sort of stay tuned. So I suppose as well, the sort of final thing to say is there's so many opportunities for young people that are sitting listening, thinking, all right, OK, this means made this sound quite quite interesting. I've quite interested in computers and you know if it's it's obviously got so many uses so um what would your sort of final inspirational piece of advice for our young people thinking that they, this is something that they want to pursue or um, find out a little bit more about i think one of the one of the simplest things you could do is start coding <laughs> there you go <laughs> because it's accessible to all there's a vast amount of resource available online to learn how to do these things and it gets you thinking logically um, you begin to work with data. It's not within your first half an hour on, on some of these things. You could be working with huge amounts of data with a few lines of code and you the, often it's a penny drop moment for a lot of people. They think, my goodness, it would have taken me weeks to try and deal with that manually mm -hmm. and I can do it in two seconds on a computer if I know a few lines of code. So it's a very empowering, you know, and whether it's whether it is biomedical AI or, or building a graph of the Marvel Universe. It, you know, these, and I'm not, that's online. You can do that if you want to. You can download the database of the Marvel Universe and plot and do some lots, lots of nice data analytics on it. So there's, there's these really fun things to do. And coding should be fun, especially at this stage. So if you can just get familiar with some coding, I think that will spark your interest and show you some of the potential in the field. So that, that's an easy sort of to do, I think. Fantastic. I think that's, that sounds excellent. Well, I'm afraid we will have to leave it there, Ian. That's That's been wonderful and a really excellent final piece of advice there is get some coding experience and, and st start your interest now. So thank you so much. Um, My pleasure. We've, we've covered so much there. I really appreciate you taking the time there. So 
I hope that you've uh, hope everybody else else out there found that interesting. Um, I just kind of brain is just going a wee bit wild right now with all the information that we've got there. But if you want any more information, advice, guidance and um, anything to do with your careers, especially with it being careers week, you know, the best person to speak to in the first instance would be your careers advisor at school. Or you can find out some more information about careers on the My World of Work website, so myworldofwork.co.uk. There's lots of information there that can help you with your choices, maybe give you some inspiration on what you'd like to do. And there are also some tools that will help you understand your strengths. So also with Scotland having just hosted COP, you know, really important um, STEM related um, a conference that we've just had, please also have a look at the Green Careers page on the My World of Work website. So that will give you a really good starting point to signpost how current jobs are evolving to become more green and ecologically beneficial for the Scottish economy. So it's not just about oh, all the jobs of the future, it's about how we are um, evolving the jobs that we have currently to make them more green. Um, if you want to earn, learn any more about Scotland's sectors or get into different areas of work, apprenticeship.scot is a fantastic place to make a start at. You know, I spoke about the um, apprenticeship and data analytics earlier on. So you can start a foundation apprenticeship learning whilst you're still at school. So you go out to industry and you'd um, have experience there whilst you're still at school. So a foundation apprenticeship to maybe get a foot in the door would be scientific technologies. It's a really good way to start um, learning about the benefits of STEM. And then things like a modern apprenticeship, that's where you sort of uh, you, you learn and get paid to do it. So something like the data analytics or even life and sciences, uh, science and related science industries. So if you're interested in something like healthcare and research, you can contribute to Scotland's ongoing advancement there. So lots of opportunities. So definitely a really good place to have a start with. Finally, as we mentioned at the beginning, it's been recorded this session, so you can view it as many times as you want and have a little look at some of the future sessions we've got coming up. So hopefully you can join us for a few of those. Finally, thank you so much, uh, Ian, for joining us um, and to you out there. There's also a survey link. We'd like to get your feedback about anything that you have uh, thought about the session today. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and we'll see you again very soon. Bye now.